uh, for a very important guest and an expert in this area, and Dr. Kennedy. Indeed, thank you so much, John. Um, yes, so it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Kennedy. Uh, Dr. Renee Kennedy serves as Chief Executive Director of MPHI, a unique public trust dedicated to advancing population health through public health innovation and collaboration. In this role, she leads the strategic direction of the organization as they strive to build a world-class infrastructure and to support the institute's diverse and progressive program areas and projects. Also, while establishing and maintaining stakeholder relationships, Sounds like a very short day, doesn't it? Anyway, uh, pr prior to joining MPHI in 2014, Dr. Kennedy served as health officer and director of Ingham County Health Department located in Lansing, Michigan. In that role, she oversaw the county's statutory responsibility to protect and promote the health of county residents and lead the expansion of the innovative and nationally known Ingham County Health Equity Social Justice Program. Dr. Kennedy has held faculty and leadership positions with the College of Nursing and the College of Medicine, Program for Public Health at Michigan State University. She developed a research trajectory in health disparities and continues to serve as an assistant professor in the Division of Public Health. Dr. Kennedy has been recognized as a national thought leader in the areas of health inequities and disparities cultural competence and social justice. She has published and presented broadly on these topics. Her passion for this work is evident in her personal, academic and professional life. Dr. Kennedy has been highly influential in broadening the discussions of health equity and social justice, while also serving on numerous national boards, review panels and advisory groups. She has served and currently serves on numerous advisory boards including the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation County Health Rankings Scientific Advisory Group, the National Collaborative for Health Equity Advisory Committee, the Institute for Alternative Futures Public Health 2030 Project Advisory Group, and the National 10 Essential Public Health Services Task Force, or just to update the foundational public framework. Dr. Kennedy serves as the treasurer on the board of directors the National Network of Public Health Institutes and as Vice President on the Ascension Health System Michigan Marketing Board. Most recently, she was appointed by Governor Gretchen Whitmer to serve on the State of Michigan Coronavirus Task Force on Racial Disparities. Most recently, Dr. Kennedy has been an outstanding public health advocate, researcher, educator, and facilitator. She's earned her PhD in medical sociology from Michigan State University, a master's degree in public administration from Western Michigan University, and a bachelor's degree in public health nutrition from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And now I wanna be like Dr. Renee Kennedy when I grow up. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so awesome. Um, so yeah, welcome. Thank, Thank you, you. Kenneth. I, I, first, I was going to say that all only means that Renee just raises her hand too much. She needs to know how to say, learn how to say no a little bit. I'm like, I need a nap after all that. Seriously, I got to figure out how to cut that back. But you know, I am I am one that um, is kind of walking in courage in this space, and I'm hoping to have y'all leave y'all at the same place where you will be the person that just has to say, uh, excuse me, but when you're sitting in meetings, when you're in your community, when you're in your faith spaces, that you're when you hear the discord that contradicts, countermands equity, I, I just want you to be that person. Do it because you'll be like, if I don't do it, then this Renee Kennedy person is going to like come to New Mexico and do it. So I better uh, carry my own weight. So thank you so much, Kenneth and Laurel. Thank you so much for um the invitation and divana for all your support and uh, i'm excited to just guide y'all through um a dialogue now we believe that dialogue is doing and if we were in the same space together let me see can you guys see this i feel like you're seeing my presentation there we go okay yeah. Hey, better? Or do you see my mm -hmm. presentation slides? Yes. 
can see it. Okay, super. Um, so thank you all for prioritizing equity in, in your goals and your strategies. I, you know, I would just submit that those first three or maybe it was four uh, that John read were also equity strategies. It is all about equity. And I love that you're having a centralized focus where you're saying we're going to be real intentional about doing this, but also recognizing that it's going to touch literally all of the work that, um, that you do. And so as of late, I've been pushing people a little bit more to be precise about what they're thinking and what they're saying and to mean what they say and say what they mean. And um, Laurel, help me with time if I you know, just interrupt me and stop me. I'll try to manage um, time as well myself, though. I'll watch for the 55 minutes from now. Around. Thank you. <laughs> sure. So we have this title, Downstream, Upstream, and Mainstream, Get Into Equity, because y'all know it's a journey, right? So we're all a part of the journey. And I just want to start out with this um, news article from the Gila Bend Herald, Gila Bend, Arizona, from 1970. And the heading says, no news value at all. Two little girls just playing peas porridge hot on the school grounds don't have much news value. They're not like racial riots and the interracial council meetings and big quarrels about school integration. However newsworthy or not, they're a lot nicer to look at than pictures of the big city's tear gas throwers. The thing about this picture that is so heartbreaking to me is that we really could almost just change the date from 1970 to 2020 because just a moment ago we were watching images of tear gas being thrown at protesters and listening to contentious debate about race um, and racism and quarreling and fighting and not listening and not at all having dialogues but being caught up in debates. Um, the particularly endearing part of this um, clip is also because uh, that little brown girl playing Peace Corps Hot is Renee Branch. Hadn't gotten the candidate part of that yet. So I was in the second grade in Arizona and this was my best friend in the world. And it was right around the time that I got my first racism lesson. I got the race talk because my dear friend was having a slumber party for her birthday. And I was the only little girl in our friend group that didn't get invited. And my mother had to explain to me that it had everything to do with the color of my skin and not at all with my heart or my character. And so interestingly enough, I just recently read an article by um, Hilbert and Dominguez, and it was a, it was a research peer-reviewed article looking at um, lifetime racism experiences and blood pressure in pregnancy. And it suggested that blood pressure in the second and third, high blood pressure in the second and third trimester was heavily correlated with low birth weight. And especially or really only that correlation was only seen if there had been experiences of racism early in childhood. Well little did I know that Renee Branch was going to grow up to be Renee Branch Kennedy who experienced the 28-week delivery of my first son due to my own blood pressure and preeclampsia and my son later losing his battle to prematurity when he was six months old. So who would think about that continuum really now being documented? We're beginning to see this whole, I know you all know the life course model and frame, that it is not just about what's happening early and later in your own life continuum, but also what is happening around you during that continuum. What things are distal or proximal or upstream or downstream? And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. But this is my why, and maybe even my why still, because I've been a public health professional for over 30 years, and it continues to be a driving force, not only for me 
And I used to say for my sons, I now have three other surviving sons, um, but now for my grandsons, because my sons are now adults. And so I didn't quite get the job done for them, but I wanted you to challenge yourself on what is your why? Why would you be willing <laughs> to risk having these really uncomfortable conversations? Why would you risk being the person to say, excuse me, have we thought about, could I suggest, maybe we should, all of those things. What is your why? Why would you do it? So let's think about words. I'm very big as a person on dialogue and narrative, we gotta say what we mean and mean what we say. And I love this quote on, downstream thinking by Rachel Molina Chan. And she says that downstream thinking is the tendency that we have as individuals and as decision makers to focus on one-off individual lifestyle-based short-term solutions rather than long-term interventions that address the root causes of well-being. We do indeed go for the low-hanging fruit. What's the easy thing? What's that one-off? On the contrary, we, we see it all the time. It's baked into the narrative, particularly of chronic disease and prevention work. You know, right? Get your healthy, eat a healthy diet. I mean, here I am with my public health nutrition degree. Eat a healthy diet, get plenty of exercise, go see your doctor, know your numbers. And now we're even more progressive and we say, oh, sleep deprivation is a thing. Get plenty of rest, take care of yourself. These you cannot get any further downstream um, in our thinking. But what is that journey upstream, the midstream passage? What does that walk home from school look like? Is it rattled with barriers and broken glass perhaps? Or is it beautiful and manicured? What is the business district look like? Is it boarded up? Or is it vibrant and inviting? The fall pumpkins are set out, we're ready for the new season. What does the indoor context of people's lives look like? Um, is it beautiful and modern? Um, and I really do the extremity of the other end as um, in honor of Flint and all that those young children went through um, in the poisoning of water system in the Flint Municipal Water System. What is that indoor experience like? And what does the view from your backyard look like? Factories, pollution, or is it beautiful, lush, green, and inviting? What, we talked about education, and it's one of your goals. What does your school district look like? These are two pictures of different schools. One at the top is an LED certified modern environment. The one at the bottom is a school that was built next to a county jail. And I would dare you to figure out which is the school and which is the jail. They are almost indistinguishable. And just think about it. Somebody sat in a meeting and said, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. I vote for that. Put the school next to the jail. These are the things that we have to be nudging along. So if we focused our attention on reducing disparities at the level of social determinants of health, will we be reducing health inequity? And I throw that out as, as, as a little bit of a rhetorical question, but one for you to ponder as you're listening. The flip side of that um, coin is almost, is social determinant work, social determinant health work enough? Is it sufficient? Will it get the job done? If we're talking about safe and affordable housing, that's important, quality education, that's important, job security, social connection, safety, living wage, reliable transportation, healthy food access. These are important things, but will that in and of themselves reduce health inequity? So let's think a little bit about these terms. One of the things um, that we found in our work in Ingham County was that we had to get on the same page because we were saying the same words, 
but meaning completely different things. And so we went through um, a, a decision-making process with our community. We always were um, very intentional about having the public and public health help set our agenda. So I'm gonna share with you some definitions that we constructed with our community in community. Um, but your, de your definitions may be slightly different based upon you all's priorities, personalities, preferences. But we landed at this definition of health inequity by Margaret Whitehead. And we didn't want to just have a conversation about health equity because that was sort of like the rainbow at the, uh, you know, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. We wanted to talk about the torturous, ugly journey that we had to get to to get there. So Margaret Whitehead's definition really resonated for us. She said that health inequity differences in population health status and mortality rates that are systemic, they are patterned, they are unfair, they are unjust, and they are actionable. Those five descriptors were what just resonated for us. And she says, as opposed to random, oh, isn't that awful that that thing happened? Isn't that terrible that um, Native Americans in New Mexico of 30% of the COVID cases, isn't that horrible? Hmm, no, there's a reason behind that. And it is not because it's caused by those who become ill. We also love that um, Margaret Whitehead invited values to the table. She said, bottom line, this is unfair and it's unjust. We have kind of crashed through that ceiling of professionalism. And it's just about the facts and the evidence. No, it is about the facts and the evidence as informed by the feelings, the opinions, and the thoughts and beliefs. And so this is where our community landed. Defining what health equity meant, and this was a, um, a Paula Bregman from UCSF was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to nationally help construct a definition of health equity. And so this is where she landed. We loved it as well. The simplest way to define health equity is to say it means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity for good health. I've seen slightly, other slightly adjusted other definitions that are like for everyone to achieve their highest well-being. But what we want you to see is that health equity as a goal, the outcome is not complicated. Some people will say, well, we don't even understand what health equity means. Simply means that everybody has a fair and just opportunity for good health. I also love and appreciate though that Paula Brinkman says, health equity is the ethical and human rights principle or value that motivates us to eliminate disparities. So again, she's inviting values to the table, right? This is an ethical issue. And so we have used both of those definitions, particularly because, again, she allows us or invites us to say, okay, for everyone to have a fair and just opportunity for good health, what's keeping us from doing that? And she says this requires removing obstacles to health, such as poverty, discrimination, their consequences, including powerlessness, lack of access to good jobs with fair pay, quality education, housing, safe environments, health care, on and on. It really is a moral imperative um, in my frame. So not just what we do, but how do we get there? We're not just trying. We're not the ones checking the box, right? We're the ones setting the trajectory. So upstream, mainstream, I believe that the only way we can confront root causes is explicitly. You can't imply it, but you can do it in a way that honors relationship. I always tell my team, um, and at uh, MPHI, we have a Center for Health Equity Practice, which we established when I came on board, um, that my two goals are to keep people whole and to keep people at the table, because privilege will cause people to shut down and leave. And we can't fix this on our own. White folk can't fix this without the involvement of black and brown folk. Otherwise, it's them doing stuff to 
us and black and brown folk can't fix this without the power and influence and access of white Americans. And so there's some spaces I've heard people say, well, white people created racism. It's their responsibility to deconstruct it. I disagree. At this point, it is this big sort of web of mutuality is a quote that Martin Luther King uses. We are all interwoven and we can only get this unknotted with each of us doing our part. And so gave you that definition for downstream, right? That least resistance, easy access. Upstream, on the other hand, involves policy approaches that have the potential to affect populations. So that would be regulation, increasing access, economic incentives. Um, many of us particularly my entire career, has not been around policy making. It has been around informing and educating policymakers. And so whatever role you're playing there, whether it be organizers really advancing change, holding policymakers accountable, that is where upstream work is happening. And it's our goal, it certainly is my goal, that all of that become the mainstream, meaning the principle or the dominant course the dominant tendency or trend, that that's, it's almost a truism that yes, of course, we're talking about these levels of oppression like racism, classism, gender, gender discrimination, gender oppression. We um, define ourselves, there are many, many organizations going through lots of um, transitions around becoming anti-racist, um, we absolutely are anti-racist, but I tend to define MPHI as an anti-oppression organization, recognizing that we have to talk about racism explicitly, but we don't talk about racism exclusively. So it is a both and at the table for us, because I want people to see oppression however they can best enter that dialogue. So it might come from um, experiencing poverty or it might come from gender oppression. Um, and of course, there are lots of other isms that we use to other people in their identities. Um, but we want to be sure that we're seeing these sort of big three as the root causes that we are trying to come against. So how does that all work together? Again, we like to be downstream, psychosocial stress. I saw lots of social workers uh, signing in on the chat. And so psychosocial stress, unhealthy behaviors, absolutely. We know those things influence inequities in the distribution of disease, illness, and well being. We have to do those things. But we also have to begin to continue to ask ourselves well, why are people of color more disproportionately affected. And again, remember that definition from Whitehead. It's not because of their fault. It's what's happening around them that is predisposing them to the behaviors that end up with stressors. And so if you're doing social determinants of health work, that's excellent. But I also want you to recognize that if you're kind of focused on social determinants of health, that that is solidly midstream work. You're not downstream where the outcome has occurred, but you're not upstream yet with social determinants of health work. So midstream at social determinants of health. And then we have to begin to say, why are some groups of people more likely to live in these impoverished communities or less likely to have reliable transportation? Why are so many of them on um, government funded school um, subsidies? Well, that is because of a number of power and wealth imbalances that just continue to exist in our society. Um, tax law, the biggest amongst them. Right? There are, um, we hear all the time, discussions around how the wealthy aren't paying their share, whatever that would mean. So these power and wealth imbalances across all of those social determinants of health, again, are also man-made. And why are there power and wealth imbalances? Well, we believe that that is the history of classism, racism, gender oppression, ultimately those being the root causes that are really um, sort of baked into our social structure. 
It was interesting because this morning I actually uh, facilitated a panel at our Maternal Child Health Summit uh, in Michigan. And one of the <clears throat> points around inequities and how we're beginning to try to change the narrative so we'll think differently, one of those points that a panelist raised was the concept of clinics that well, um, well supported, well um, educated Americans don't go to clinics. They go see their primary care doc and they have a continuum of a relationship, continuity of care with that person. But if you're under-resourced, <clears throat> then you go to the clinic and immediately there are all types of labels associated with that word clinic. And it, this is, again, how it's sort of baked into the social structure of how we design health and well-being and prevention in this society. So the, again, the goal is to move from downstream at behaviors and health outcomes to move midstream to social determinants, get upstream to power and wealth, and then ultimately we know that the mainstream will be about deconstructing racism, racialized um, systems that impact social determinants of health. You can address social determinants of health without ever really talking about racism, classism, or gender, uh, um, gender oppression. And so we just want the dialogue to be comprehensive for what you're doing and in your thinking. So primary care prevention, if you would think about it from a social determinant, a social justice framework, and, and John read this well-known, uh, cited this well-known World Health Organization definition of social determinants of health where people live, where they're born, grow, live, work, play, pray, age. We've just added all types of other contexts to that definition. And so if we're looking at primary prevention through a social justice lens, we would submit, my colleagues and I in community that have done this thinking and dialoguing, that there's sort of two things we need to focus on. One is how do we make the invisible visible? And second, how do you deconstruct racism and oppression? So let's think for a second about making the invisible visible. I'm showing you here a diagram. What would you say this image is? I said diagram, but it's actually an image. It's not a, a, a Rorschach spot. It's not up for your interpretation. It is a thing. So let's see, can you put right in the chat while I have this up? Let's see what I, because I want you to put in the chat what you think this is. So I might need to stop the share for a second. Here, let's see if we can, if that will help us. So everybody's got that image in their mind. Turn your head, we're gonna get upside down, look at it from all angles and throw, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second so you can put in the chat and I can see your responses. What do you think this is? That image. Let's see, we've got a skull, we've got a cat face. A map from distance, statue, aerial view of land and water, cow, the wall of an apartment. Wouldn't that be exotic? Pathology slide. You know, I like to say that sometimes we see things not as they are, but as we are. All right, you've got that clinical eye. It must be a pathology slide. Well, let's, let me put that back up and show it to you again. Somebody did actually get it. I'm impressed. Maybe they saw me do this talk before. I don't know. This is actually a cow. And half of y'all are going, eh, they ain't no cow. So can you see my cursor? John, I can see your name. Do you see my cursor moving around on this? Your cursor. I can see yeah. your cursor. Yeah. Okay, great. So here is the bridge of the cow's nose, and here are the nostrils. Here is a little cow eye, and a cow ear, and another cow ear. 
on the top of its head. So this journey, getting to equity, is about making the invisible visible. Because once you see the cow, you can't unsee it. Once you see inequity, once you see racism, you cannot unsee it. You recognize it every time. And so that's where we're trying to get you in this social justice lens, leading you um, a social justice strategy that leads you to equity. So making the invisible visible. And then the second point about how do you deconstruct racism? Again, very similar. You combine those things and you begin to look for those inequities. So just for an example, I just want to push a little bit on social determinants of health. So it's not just necessarily about having safe and affordable housing. Um, but look at this distinction between, is it about safe and affordable houses, like what's happening for me and my family, or is there a pattern of safe and affordable housing, public housing, which is poorly kept, under-resourced, <coughs> dangerous, set in a high crime area. So these distinctions that just because we're doing social determinant of health work, does not mean that we're doing it in a way that deconstructs isms and oppression, racism, classism, gender, or doing it in a way that differentiates well-being for those experiencing the negative effects of social determinants of health. So how do we begin to see differently? How do we begin to do differently in terms of our interventions that we would um, recommend? Well, we suggest that you do that by asking the right, not even asking the right questions. I'm just, today I feel like it's not always about the right question because I don't want you to even feel like um, there's a possibility that you could be wrong, right? And, and again, this is like a real tangible demonstration of how steeped we are in our socialization, right? Oh, right versus wrong is a real clear, um, sort of white American culture, right? We, I, and I've been hesitating even with the use of the term white supremacy um, because that is a thing, right? White supremacist culture is a thing. But I also want to keep people home and keep people at the table. So I want to have this dialogue in a way that, that doesn't shut people down. But this whole ask the right questions is also a mindset. So eternally always growing. But Let's say that advancing dialogue is about asking the questions, being the one that's courageous enough to ask the questions, to move beyond that socialization of, I don't want to ask a stupid question, um, but so you sit down and you don't talk. When we are um, preparing facilitators to do our workshop, oftentimes they'll say to us, I feel like I'm not ready because I don't have all the answers. And we'll say, bing, that means you're ready. So we don't get to health equity by having all the answers. We get there rather by asking deep questions. And what do those look like? So let me just give you a few examples of getting upstream as mainstream in sort of these chronic disease examples for you. Very classic prevention question, public health prevention question. Why do people smoke? And we want people to keep asking that question, right? But we also <clears throat> want people to ask what social conditions and economic policies predispose people to the stress that encourages smoking? Not just like eye on that person, right? It is both and. Not stop asking that question, but let's also ask this question. Who lacks access to healthy food options and why? Well, what are the economic shifts that would redistribute healthy food resources more equitably in our community? I mean, if you, well, the last time I was in an airport, which has been a long time now, um, but, you know, I'm always trying to stay healthy and make healthy choices, you know, that for, for food groups, for pictures from the start of my talk. <clears throat> and I was in the, had quite a layover and it's like, okay, what can I get to eat that would be healthy? 
and I'm looking and they've got a lot of choices. They had a box of carrots and celery and you know, I'm like, okay, I, I can get the carrots and celery. And I asked the woman, it was a small box, right? Very small box. How much is, are the carrots and celery and the little thing of ranch? Oh, that's $11.99, $11.99 for some carrots. Hmm, how much are the french fries? Well, if I was there, I'd be asking you, what do y'all think how much the french fries were? Yeah, yeah, they were like $4.99, which was still kind of a lot, but it wasn't $11.99 for some carrots. And so there are reasons why, right? There, I mean, and this goes all the way back to potato subsidies. It's just, you get a break when you're growing potatoes. Who's gonna vote for the celery subsidy or the carrot subsidy? Or what were the root causes, the way upstream things that contributed to those outcomes, right? Because they're all about policy and they're all about decisions. So what could we do to redistribute those healthy resources? How do we connect isolated individuals to social support? Perhaps we should also ask, what are the institutional policies and practices that maintain rather than counteract people's isolation from social support? If you look at, speaking of public housing, if you have a history of a felony, then you are ineligible for living in public housing, at least in the state of Michigan you are. So if the goal is reuniting families and we're acknowledging the importance of social support, if the incarcerated person left a spouse or a significant others who then because of the loss of household income, right, then moves into public housing, you're already, the regulation is maintaining, is counteracting um, people's, uh, maintaining rather than counteracting their isolation from support. All of these subtle things that we have to be the ones in the room going, have we ever thought about? And lastly, who lacks health care insurance coverage, lacks health care coverage and why? And I put this up here because we're in this tension right now, right? So we had the Affordable Care Act as an example of a policy that redistributed health care resources more equitably. But we also see now that same policy coming under um, review. I was going to say attack, but I'm going to be intentional about my words, right? It's being reconsidered. So just as much as we made that policy um, to provide resources to people, there are people looking to deconstruct that policy. And so, again, what is the entirety of the dialogue, both at the personal level, but also at the system level, the structural level, the institutional level, so that we can see mainstream uh, getting upstream as mainstream. So a couple points to just land on and um, we'll just begin to unshare screen and then we can talk a little bit. Um, let me give you these suggestions from our learning. One, we've got to recognize that treating the consequences of inequity through programs and services alone will never eliminate health inequity. Never ever. It will just keep us all employed doing stuff at the programmatic and the service level without shifting why those services are needed. Oops. Mandate a re-examination of public health priorities, practices, and the use of resources. Um, you heard uh, Kenneth mentioned in my introduction that I was a part of the 10 Essential Public Health Services Review Committee, um, which we've now launched. I hope you all will check that out. We've centered equity, literally and figuratively, in that diagram. Um, but that, we hope, is the start of people saying, we've got to re-examine what do we do in health and public health, and even in health care, and how are we using those resources? Third thing, communicate facts about the forces that produce or undermine health to constituents, um, responsible public institutions, shout it out to public leaders. We've got to be, you know, there's a whole lot of debate right now in the COVID response around what is facts and what is fake news. Um, and we're seeing even the Centers for Disease Control being pushed based upon different frames 
around how they say what they say. So we've got to continue to get things upstream by communicating facts that force and produce and undermine health. Um, um, un uh, facts about what produces and undermines health. Fourth, develop a policy agenda for health equity and identify strategic activities with constituencies that support this agenda. You guys are in the midst of doing that. So I'm going to skip right by. That, that's excellent. Um, and lastly, how do you engage with communities to develop their own capacity to, and their own resources to participate fully in social and political processes? We have a bad habit of, <clears throat> at worst, doing things to communities at best doing um, a little more improvement, doing things for communities. How do we get to doing things with communities? Um, or positioning communities to do it and then just being technical assistance or resources as possible. So think there are very tangible things that we need to begin to do differently um, as we advance equity. Um, we talked a lot about this equity lens. A lot of times we'll say, oh, we want to center equity. We want, we want to use an equity lens. And as our community sat around, we just kind of like, well, what is that exactly do we mean by that? And so the what for us was that we would, <clears throat> we deconstructed a lot of the definitions that I shared with you early. And we said, if we, if we believed that definition, what would that look like in action? And this is what we came up with. So the what is identify and facilitate opportunities for communities to readily and easily attain well-being. My 25-year-old son, when he was in college, called me one day, Mom, I'm, I'm done eating junk food. I'm just, this is ridiculous. I feel terrible. I'm going to eat healthy. And about two weeks later, he says, yeah, you're going to have to kind of up my uh, weekly allowance for me to eat healthy because it's way more expensive to buy healthy food than to just run down the street at the dollar menu. And that's true. So it's not healthy opportunity, access to healthy food is not easily attainable. Why? We said that we wanted to look at things through an equity lens because we recognize the impact of social resources on the care and the behavior of community members. That seems common sense to us, but there are many entities that really only see this work from a biomedical framework. But social resources and the, has an impact on the care and the behavior of the communities we are endeavoring to serve. How do we do this? Two things. One, we want to seek out what is unfair. Uh, instead of just saying this is unfair and unjust, we want to seek it out in order to reverse it and in order to avoid it. Not like, oh, found one. Nope. What are we going to do to avoid that um, and to reverse that? And then also to aspire to apply justice in how we're serving communities. We have the very um, um, unfortunate history of being socialized to define fairness as sameness. Oh, I treat everyone the same. I can't tell you how many physicians, clinicians, service providers I've heard say that. I'm not racist. I treat everyone the same. Well, um, in many ways, the most unfair thing we can do is to treat people the same because they don't have the same needs. And so we have to give ourselves permission to apply justice in serving communities. That means meeting their needs as what they um, prioritize and not giving them things that they don't need. And who is absolutely you, that we all see ourselves as responsible for doing this work. So let me, um, let me throw out a couple more questions for you to think about, and then we're going to shut down and talk a little bit. We have been um, thinking about, part of our goal was, how do you transform public health practice? And we began to think about change. And we didn't want just change for the sake of change, change for the sake of busyness to say we did something different, but really wanted to be change for meaning, um, change that is advancing equity, and change that is indeed moving us upstream. So we came up with these three questions. Does the change that you want to make in whatever practice um, you have at work, does it make an important difference? Does it have an impact? Secondly, could the change be done? You know, sometimes we can be a little pie in the sky. 
well, you know, if we could just pay everybody $19 an hour, $25 an hour, then we wouldn't have this issue with, yeah, well, but is that feasible? So what, can the change be done? Could it be done? If it indeed would be important, can it be done? Feasibility. And then lastly, is it a sustainable change? Because you don't want to put a lot of work into something that's going to spiral back in three months. So would this change stick? Or would things go back to the status quo after the initial um, application? You'd want to get a grant, a one-year grant, and come up with some amazing process that then spirals back to where it was pre-grant. So think about the impact of your change that you want to make, the feasibility of the change that you want to make, and the sustainability of the change that you want to make. We want things to change for good. So let me just close with this quote. I love quotes. Um, and this is by um, Saint, uh, Antoine Saint de Saint-Exupéry. And he says, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and don't assign them task or work. You know, we're really good at that. Delegation. We are good at delegation. Uh, but he says instead, rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. And we believe that health equity is that endless immensity of the sea. We're not precisely sure how we're gonna get there, but if we believe and honor the people living the experience, that that shared knowledge can be elevated and we will indeed build the thing together. So thank you guys for your attention. And um, Laurel, how are, how are we doing? Can we, can we chat a little bit?